Let's read some first-hand combat accounts of Tomahawks. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator, and you can consider this one of my story time episodes. And here we're going to be looking at um, primary source, or at least period accounts, of the use of the tomahawk. Now before I go on, I should mention that tomahawk is a fairly loose term that was used, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, to refer to small axes or small hatchets. And most people would associate these, of course, with Native Americans, and that's where the word originally comes from. But in fact, the word was used much more widely than that. In the period accounts we're going to look at here, we should also bear in mind that these are 18th and 19th century sources, so they use period language. We should also remind ourselves, of course, that these are sources that have bias. They're historical sources and they should be taken with a pinch of salt. But before I go any further into this video, I just want to have a quick word about our fantastic sponsors for this video, who are Mech Arena. In Mech Arena, you can pilot some of the most awesome mechs with cool armor, color schemes and weapons and destroy the enemy team. If you're tired of pay to win games, then this is the game for you because it's skill based, it's free to download, free to play, and the more you play, the better you'll get. Recently, Mech Arena held a real world event on Santa Monica Pier. The mechs are here, that's right, between now and December the 15th, you can help Mech Arena to raise 100,000 US dollars for charity by destroying 1 billion mechs online. That's right, by playing Mech Arena, you can help to raise $100,000 for charity by killing 1 billion mechs in game. As the entire community plays the game and kills more mechs, then Mech Arena is going to donate more money to charity and give rewards to the players as well. As well as loot in-game, you can actually win Mech Arena merch, which will be delivered straight to your door. As well as all of this and the chance to help raise $100,000 for charity, the 10 best players are going to be selected for a championship, Mech Arena Championship on December the 16th, and they're going to get the chance to pilot a real life mech. That sounds great, yeah? You want to help charity, you want to get the chance to win some prizes, and also get the chance to pilot a real life mech. Well, here's how to get started. All you have to do is install the game via my link below or the QR code on screen. It's completely free to download and play on either Android or iOS. And if you use my link, then you'll get 50,000 credits, three gold crates, and an exclusive mechs are here skin to use. To win the really massive prizes like the mech experience or the merch box, then all you have to do is once you're in game in the hangar, go to the mechs are here button and click on that. And that is it, you can start playing now for free and you can help a great charity out just by playing and destroying those mechs. So thanks very much for staying with me. Now let's get back to the subject of Tomahawks and first hand accounts that I'm gonna be reading some out of uh, for you here. I um, use the British newspaper archive, which I'm a big fan of and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of sources on there. Now, we should mention about those sources, as I've already mentioned uh, in this video already, there's inherent bias to these sources. They're not always accurate. Sometimes they're made up stories. Sometimes they are first-hand witness accounts. Uh, and of course, the bias of, of the period is not just, should we say, cultural, it's ethnic, it's um, political. Sometimes we're describing accounts from a British perspective of things happening in the Americas, sometimes before the War of Independence, sometimes during it, sometimes after it, when sometimes the Americans or the European settlers of America are considered the enemy. And sometimes indeed the indigenous people, the Native Americans of America are considered as the enemy. And sometimes they're considered as allies. Because for anyone who doesn't know, Native Americans formed various alliances with both the British and the French to fight each other. And then also with the British to fight against the Americans as well. Uh, so it it's complicated. You've got to take these sources in that light. They're very much uh, historical sources of their day that have to be taken uh, with, um, with some wisdom, should we say, and hindsight. Now also, before I delve into these sources, I should mention what is a tomahawk? Well, quite simply, it is, um, it is a word which comes from, um, it comes from the Americas, it comes from Native American languages, and it was adopted into European language very, very quickly, it seems, uh, probably, uh, by the, certainly by the 18th century, it becomes quite prevalent. And in fact, if we look at the um, number of hits that I get searching on the newspaper archive, British newspaper archive, then indeed you can see that the word was uh, heavily used in the 18th century, increasingly so, and then very heavily used in the 19th century. So much heavily used and liked that the word tomahawk was used 
uh, for the naming of things, uh, things like, well, obviously in the 20th century, famously a, uh, a type of aeroplane, um, but additionally, even for things like racehorses in the 19th century. So it actually becomes quite difficult when you're just word searching to pull out the sources that really just refer to the use of tomahawks. Now, what were tomahawks in the time? Well, quite simply, obviously, originally, it probably refers to Native American weapons that don't use metallic heads that originally have stone or other things um, in the head. But they come to be used, the word tomahawk comes to be used for a variety of axes and hatchets. Okay, so it tends to be one handed axes rather than large sort of wood felling axes. Um, and they can have a simple blade, they can have a hammer on the back, they can have a pipe built into them so you can smoke them. Um, and indeed, sometimes they have spikes or hooks or other things on the back as well. So they come in, and indeed, they don't always have an axe blade. Sometimes you get a spontoon um, style, almost pick or warhammer type spike. Bike. So there's a huge variety of uh, tomahawks and they were used both as weapons and as tools and as status symbols as well, it has to be said. In case you're curious, the axes featured in this video are by Condor, by Thor's Forge and by Ravensbeak Forge. So without further ado, let's plunge into some of these primary sources that contain some interesting an anecdotes, observations and sometimes some surprising facts. So the first account we're going to look at is from the Leeds Intelligencer of Tuesday the 29th of April 1760. So of course uh, this is a period during which which uh, this area of America is under British sovereignty. Um, and it is from Charlestown, South Carolina, uh, the report being on February the 23rd. Um, and it says, Letters are just received from Fort Prince George, which are dated the 24th past, containing the following account of the late attempt of the Indians to seize that place. That on the 16th, two Indian wenches appearing on the riverside at Kiowi, Mr. Doherty went out of the fort to ask them what news there was. That presently, after the great warrior of Kenote appeared and desired that he would call the commanding officer of the fort and tell him he wanted to talk to him. That Doherty, according accordingly did so, and Lieutenant Coitmore went to the bank of the river, accompanied by Ensign Bell, Doherty, and Foster, the interpreter, that the great warrior told Mr. Coitmore he intended to come down to the governor and would be glad to have a white man to accompany him as a safeguard, having somewhat of consequence to impart. Mr. Coitmore answered that he should have one, whereupon the great warrior said he would go and catch a horse for him. Mr. Coitmore told him he needed not give himself that trouble, but the warrior said that he would, and while he was speaking, he swung a bridle, which he held carefully in his hand, thrice over his head, upon which twenty-five or thirty guns were immediately discharged at Mr. Coitmore and his company from different ambuscades where the Cherokees were placed before day, and to whom the shaking of the bridle was a signal. Mr. Coitmore was shot through the left breast, which proved mortal. Mr. Bell in the calf of the leg, and Foster in the buttock. That Ensign Millin, who was left in the fort, upon such a piece of treachery, judging it improper and unsafe for the garrison, that the hostages should continue any longer only confined to a room, ordered the soldiers to bind and put them in irons, that the soldiers accordingly set about executing the order. When the first who attempted to take hold of an Indian was killed on the spot, being struck with a tomahawk on the head, stabbed in the belly with a knife and having his jaw broken, and another was wounded in the forehead, also with a tomahawk. This outrage being committed directly after that upon Mr. Coitmore so alarmed and highly incensed the garrison that it was thought expedient to put all the hostages to death immediately, which was done accordingly. That in the evening some Indians came near the fort, fired two signal guns, and several times cried out in the Cherokee language, not knowing what had happened, Fight strong, and you shall be assisted! Soon after which, the Indians began and continued most part of the night firing on all sides of the fort, but they did no damage. That hence it was suspected that it had been concerted between the hostages within and their friends without to attack and massacre the garrison that night, which suspicion was confirmed the next day, for upon searching the apartment in which the hostages had lay, there was found 
Besides a bottle of poison, doubtless designed to have been emptied into the well, several tomahawks buried in the earth, which their friends, who were suffered to visit them, must have privately conveyed thither. So in all probability, the putting of the hostages to death had proved a very critical event, while the garrison are freed to f for future apprehensions from within. So what we see here is essentially an, what seems to be an ongoing feud uh, between the fort and the local Cherokee. Um, and the, the, some had been taken prisoner and the Cherokee um, outside had basically hatched a plot, according to this art article, whether it's true or not, we don't really know, uh, in order to free them. And they had gone in to talk to them. They'd smuggled in some hatchets and some tomahawks and they had been buried in the earth um, so that they could use them later so that the, uh, there'd been a concerted effort with this signal to attack from outside and to attack from within and to take the fort. So a very interesting um, episode, obviously quite uh, tragic for the hostages uh, and indeed the other people who were killed during the incident. But here we see the tomahawk being the absolutely key hand-to-hand -hand weapon uh, that was pre prepared for such an encounter. And also very interesting detail that these tomahawks were buried uh, because burying the hatchet, as we know, uh, is a sign of peace. So you're putting the hatchets away and burying them. But tomahawks are constantly referred to in the period sources as being buried in the ground, which is very, very interesting. And perhaps this is an old tradition that goes back pre-metal-headed uh, tomahawks uh, to various types of war club. Perhaps they were sometimes buried in the ground um, to, uh, obviously for symbolic reasons, for war and peace and, and pulled out when at time of war. But perhaps also, like here, for episodes of subterfuge as well. And of course, with a non-metallic head, it wouldn't rust in the ground. With a metallic head, it would, but I suppose you could wrap it in something or cover it in grease or something like that if you were worried about rust. But of course, even if this has got rust on it, it's still going to function as an effective weapon. Now, the word tomahawk had already passed into widespread use in Britain and in America in the English language and indeed uh, outside of the English language as well um, but it had already passed into common sense of what a tomahawk was so even to the point that here we have an article from the Derby Mercury of uh, 1764 February 1764 so in the UK in Derby uh, not the most cosmopolitan place in 1764 I tell you um, people knew what a tomahawk was such that it wasn't seen necessary to spell out what a tomahawk was so already by the middle of the 1700s. And uh, the incident is this, and this seems like a relatively straightforward uh, encounter between, well, as it turned out, two hostile people. And it says, the week before last, an inhabitant of Minisink, or Minifink, I'm not sure what that is from the writing, being on a hunting for deer, so deer hunting expedition, on the west side of the Delaware, fell in with a single Indian. When it says fell in, that means fell out, actually. Um, so came into an encounter. Uh, they, espying each other almost at instant, immediately treed. Now, I'm not certain what that means, but if you read Last of the Mohicans, there's lots of climbing into trees. So I'm not sure whether that's what that means, but I don't know what treed means. And after exchanging several shots, the Indian imagined that he'd wounded his, an his antagonist. <laughs> Kind of suggesting that maybe this guy who was out hunting actually took a pot shot at the uh, Native American and the Native American decided he wasn't having any of that. Anyway, um, and, the, and he rushed, the Indian this is, the, uh, uh, he rushed in upon him with his tomahawk. But the white man, after receiving two desperate wounds from the Indian, knocked his brains out with the end of his musket, cut his head off and brought it home in triumph. So, I mean, that's a fairly bloody encounter, and obviously we will never know what exactly happened there. The fact that this is being reported in a newspaper suggests that this is not a common occurrence, actually. Uh, and obviously this is something being reported from far away, being reported in Derby. Uh, but, you know, people lapped up stories like these, and stories of the, the, the wild frontier in America and what's now the USA and, and Canada. They were lapping it up in Britain uh, and they were writing stories about it and telling tales about it. So there was very much, and you know, I have to say again, obviously I'm just reading the text. It is obviously we refer to people as Native Americans for the most part now. 
um, or various other more modern terms. Um, but in all of these sources, they pretty much use the word Indian. Um, and so I will read that when I read it on the page. But um, in this case, we'll never really know what happened. But again, it's the tomahawk. When you get a Native American coming into conflict, it is so often a tomahawk, but not always Native Americans, as we'll see as we go through these sources. Now we fast forward another few years, but still pre-American War of Independence. Uh, so we're still talking about British uh, areas of control. And this is another article from a British newspaper, the Leeds Intelligencer, again, this time from September 1771. And it, this is an extract of a letter from Pennsylvania, which itself was dated August the 1st. And it says, the following account was received here this day from Fort Chartres. One Wood, a soldier in the Royal Regiment of Ireland, was taken prisoner by a party of Potawatomi, I hope I pronounced that right, Indians, after a most gallant uh, resistance. The poor lad was amusing himself with his gun a little way from the fort, presumably shooting practice. A savage came up to him with the intention to take a, take a tomahawk to him, but the soldier killed him with a load of shot that he had in his gun. Now, that's an interesting detail. A load of shot might suggest buckshot, and it might suggest that he was shooting at birds. But anyway, that's a minor detail. Um, then a number of about 20 leapt out of the bushes to surround him. He then took to his heels, that means ran away, of course, and loaded with ball as he ran. Now, there's an inter interesting detail, because prior to that, he'd shot uh, shot, which would mean essentially, um, you know, shot for shooting birds. Uh, but now he's loading with ball. Some people might call that a bullet, but musket ball. Um, as he ran. Now, some this is an interesting detail because some people who, for example, watch the movie Last of the Mohicans, debate how possible it is to load a, um, a, a muzzle-loading flintlock musket or rifle whilst running. Well, here we have a historical account from 1771 actually describing this happening. It goes on. The Indians, finding that he outran them, that sounds somewhat unlikely, but anyway, uh, fired a volley after him um, and wounded him. He took to a tree. Again, we've got this taking to a tree thing, which is something we see in the book of Last of the Mohicans. So I wonder if the previous account, which talked about treed, meant taking to a tree. And when you think about it, this might have a practical usage in the age of muzzle loading, fairly slow loading uh, firearms, where if you can climb up a tree, you can fend someone off for long enough while you reload. Um, or it might not mean that. It might mean I'm just writing far too much into this or trying to analyse, overanalyse. And uh, possibly he just simply took to a tree because he didn't know what else to do and he was wounded and he couldn't run anymore. Um, uh, and they surrounded him. He shot another from the tree. So he had reloaded again by this point, which would kind of reinforce my theory. Uh, but he was overpowered and led away in triumph, poor fellow. I suppose for a deliberate torture. And you'll notice a lot of these accounts when you look at 18th century and 19th century accounts of conflict between Native Americans and European settlers, they often talk about um, torture and they often make a big thing of um, the Native Americans torturing people. And some of this undoubtedly did happen in both directions, but also um, I think there was a degree of politicization and propaganda with all of these things. So there is a degree of trying to demonize uh, the people who are seen as other or the enemy in some cases. And you'll notice that when we get into uh, British accounts where the Native Americans are allies, they talk about them in completely different terms and they stop talking about things like torture and savagery and they talk about them as their noble allies. Propaganda again. So you, with newspapers, you've always, always just as the same as today, you've got to be very careful about what you uh, read and interpret. Um, however, the savages acknowledged to the French on the opposite side of the river that they, that they had bought his life very do dearly. That means that he'd killed two of them in the process. So again, a uh, heavily propaganda and politicised thing. We even see mentions of the French um, here. Uh, and in this case, there is the implication that these savages are allies of the French. Again, interesting, they're savages when they're allied with the enemy, but they're not savages when they're allied with you. So uh, a perfect example, I think, of how to be very careful when we're reading historical period accounts. 
But again, we see the tomahawk is always the uh, go-to default weapon, hand weapon, of Native Americans in this period. So now we're forwarding to 1775, only a few years later, and this is from the Shrewsbury Chronicle, uh, 20th of May 1775. And this is talking about the um, infantry, uh, levies, militia, whatever you want to call them, that were being raised in the colonies, as they would have been known in Britain at the time, in the American colonies, um, and essentially how they're structured and what equipment they have. So here, interestingly, we have the word tomahawk used, which is a Native American word, but it's being used to the equipping of European settler troops for the most part. Um, so they, are, they have adopted the tomahawk or perhaps there are weapons like the um, other types of axe. Uh, and of course, a lot of these, in fact, most of these were being imported um, from Europe or made in the um, European colonies in America and being sold to Native Americans. So even, even when this is a Native American weapon in Native American hands, it's often Europe, well, pretty much always European made. But there were other types of axes as well. And we know that certain types of um, boarding axe, essentially, or a hatchet, were used by European settlers widely. They were also used by sailors very widely. And in fact, if we look at the golden age of piracy, which of course is, let's say, it culminates in about the 1720s, then very often pirates are represented with axes. Now, this could again be propaganda because this is seen as a more savage and brutal weapon than something like a, a sword, it's certainly more than a small sword, uh, and to some degree perhaps more than a, a cutlass or, or dusak as well. And in fact, there's this famous image of um, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, where they're both armed with what look like medieval battle axes, um, but they're probably supposed to be representative of boarding axes, which undoubtedly were used by pirates and everybody else. So, yes, absolutely, more traditional styles of Native American tomahawk were used, as well as other hatchets and axes. And the word tomahawk could be applied to all of them in this period because the fame of the Native American tomahawk was so great at this time and so influential uh, on the kind of uh, common public's mind that they would often refer to any old axe as a tomahawk. So it says that each company of infantry consists of 68 rank and file to be commanded by one captain, two lieutenants or lieutenants if you're American, one ensign, ensign maybe, uh, four sergeants, four corporals, and that they have a drummer and be furnished with a drum and colours, that every man be provided with a good rifle if to be had, or otherwise if not to be had, with a common firelock. So in other words, with a smoothbore musket if you can't get hold of a good rifle. Also a bayonet and cartouche box, and also with a tomahawk, one pound of gunpowder and four pounds of ball of lead, fitted to the bore of his gun, <laughs> so bullets of the right size, um, uh, and that he be clothed in a hunting shirt by way of uniform. So we see really here the, the, the famous image of the forces of uh, the independence uh, war against the fighting against the British. These are much more kind of practical uh, forest dwelling and swamp dwelling uh, freedom fighters, certainly from an American point of view. Um, and that all endeavour as soon as possible to become acquainted with the military exercise for infantry appointed to be used by His Majesty in the year 1764. Uh, so these are, in theory, uh, Brit at this point, British troops who are supposed to be drilled according to the uh, regulations of 1764. Although, of course, a lot of these troops would have been equipped with tomahawks, so therefore they could be in British service or indeed in uh, later uh, independence uh, American service equipped with tomahawks um, and a lot of these people would have been equipped by uh, his majesty and then of course would have turned coat they would have turned and, and joined the independence movement which is fair enough now this is the part that surprised me slightly it goes on it says each troop of horse so cavalry consists of 30 um, exclusive of officers, that every horseman be provided with a good horse, a bridle, a saddle, with pistols and holsters, a carbine, that is a short musket, or some other short firelock, so it could be any type of short um, musket basically, with a bucket, you think well, you need a, bu a bucket is for the carbine to go into, so it's like a holster for a, for a long arm, 
a cutting sword or tomahawk. One pound of gunpowder and four pounds of ball at least uh, and use the utmost diligence in training and um, conditioning his horse um, so that he can discharge of, uh, to the discharge of firearms and in making himself acquainted with the military exercise for cavalry. And this is an order coming from London on May the 13th, um, 1775. Now, what I found fascinating here is I have never heard reference before to tomahawks being used by cavalry. And here it clearly says to furnish them with a cutting sword. Now, what does they mean by cutting sword? Well, either a sabre or a back sword or a broad sword, basically. So they mean not... Uh, not a, a small sword, not a thrusting sword. Um, so a cutting sword or tomahawk. That's like crazy. So basically, if your body of horse, if you couldn't furnish them with 30 swords, then you'd make do with tomahawks. Fascinating. I never knew that um, cavalry was sometimes armed with tomahawks, at least on paper. Maybe in reality, there were enough cutting swords for them to all have swords, but at least it's in the regulations coming from London that they could also be armed with tomahawks on horseback. So here we have another account of these uh, famous American riflemen, and this account is from 1776. So obviously this is uh, looking at things from a different point of view now, uh, because history has moved on. And this says, uh, and sorry, this is the Derby Mercury of uh, 17th of May, 1776. And it says, much has been said of the riflemen of the provincial army and of the almost unerring certitude of their aim. That's what they're famous for, right? The, the, like, um, much like Hawkeye, the, the accuracy of their sniping, as we'd call it today, marksmanship. And of the uh, almost unerring uh, certainty, certitude of their aim. But there is another part of their military apparatus, perhaps still more more tremendous, of which the public prints have given no account. The infantry of the American troops carry no bayonets, in the place of which each soldier has a brace of excellent pistols slung to his belt, together with a tomahawk <laughs> or war hatchet. Now, I think, I don't think they mean tomahawk or war hatchet like they're two separate things. I think they're just for anyone who doesn't know what a tomahawk is, it's a war hatchet, it's an axe. In the exercise of the latter, that is the tomahawk, um, they are no less expert than the riflemen at firing a mark. So in other words, yes, they are awesome marksmen with rifles, but this is saying, the Derby Mercury, that they're also really bloody good with using their tomahawks in combat. At the distance of 20 yards, their aim is generally fatal. Their aim, that's right, they're not just using it in hand-to-hand -hand combat, they're throwing them. And um, these they use against a party advancing with the bayonet. So the implication here, now whether this is true or not, I don't know, but they certainly believed it was true when they wrote it. And they are saying that these riflemen, if they were being charged by people with bayonets at close range, presumably if they didn't have time to reload and they themselves not having bayonets, would throw with unerring aim their tomahawks at the advancing British bayoneteers. And it goes on. At a distance of 20 yards, their aim is generally fatal. And they use and they use against uh, they use it against a party advancing with a bayonet. The direct the direction is at the head, which is death if the blow takes place. And their pistols are for close combat. Add to this that the grenadier companies are armed with lances, aka spears or spontoons, which is a better weapon than the bayonet. I'd actually agree with that last part, definitely. Absolutely fascinating. I had not read an account exactly like this. So what they're saying is that they, they the standard riflemen were excellent with their tomahawks, that they uh, were obviously excellent marksmen, but if they were charged by bayonets, they would throw the tomahawks at the heads of the charging infantry. And then they would use the brace of pistols in close combat. Fascinating. Um, and uh, kind of the opposite to what you expect because you think about the pistols being discharged at range and then this being used at the hand. This account, whether it's true or not, says that they threw the tomahawk and then used the pistols at even closer range, uh, presumably just out of bayonet range. Uh, so a fascinating account and here we categorically have tomahawks or war hatchets being used in the hands of American revolutionary forces against the British.
Now here we have a slightly different take and mention on the tomahawk and this is essentially from Parliament, it's from the British Parliament. Uh, this is featured in the Scots magazine of um, August 1778 and it's now a period where the British are looking to ally with the Native Americans against the rebels as the British see them. Um, and so the parliamentary discussion says or goes like this. It says, his lordship declared to us in express terms that the Congress had endeavoured to engage the Indian savages in their service and would have employed them in the war. It is well known in what manner they must be employed, not in the use of the sword and bayonet, of which they are ignorant, but the scalping knife and tomahawk, in which they are expert. In this manner, they have been employed by General Burgoyne. And it goes on to basically say, discuss the the ways in which they might conduct the war or should have conducted the war. And it's a debate. It's a parliamentary debate. So I won't go into it because it gets quite meaty and complicated. And it's all to do with laying blame on who's done things right and who's done things wrong. But it's just an interesting example of how now the the Indian savages, as the, as the British press normally describes them at this time, are now starting to become allies rather than enemies. Um, and indeed, it's a period in which there were some quite large groups of Native Americans who um, formed into uh, sort of confederations to fight against uh, European settler um, uh, Americans, essentially. Difficult with the terminology here. Um, but it also just kind of reiterates this idea that for the most part, the best way for Native American troops or warriors to fight is in their traditional manner in which they are accustomed. That is with the knife, the tomahawk, the bow, the rifle, the musket, um, skirmishing, hit and run, this kind of things, not using the sword and the bayonet in the traditional European fashion. So even the British, who liked to go to places like India and train sepoy soldiers to fight in the European fashion, even the British recognised the best way to uh, engage Native American troops was for them to fight to their strengths and fight in the ways and with the weapons that they were most familiar with. So here is an article from the Hampshire Chronicle of February 1786 and this is a kind of I think the context of this is that it's the increasing interest in Britain in the various peoples of uh, what's now known as the USA uh, because they are potential allies basically in trying to get <laughs> the, the North America back under British control and so there are lots of descriptive accounts and sort of uh, factoids about these people not all accurate by any sense and obviously heavily biased sometimes completely misinformed but they do contain some nuggets of inf interesting information and this is talking about a confederation of, um, of tribes that include the Mohawk I won't go into the detail of it. it talks a lot about the different tribes and who's in charge of who and uh, kind of um, uh, domination of certain tribes over others and the payment of uh, taxes essentially uh, between one tribe and another. But I won't go into that detail. But it says, talking about their weapons, it says their arms are muskets, long knives and a small hatchet called a tomahawk, which they never cease to carry about them. The last serves them also as a pipe a steel bowl being fixed on the head of the hatchet and a tube running up the handle. This they throw with such certainty and dexterity as to stick the edge into any object at considerable distance. They express peace by the metaphor of a fire and tree and war by an axe or hatchet. These are the brave, the free, the faithful allies that England has so shamefully abandoned. Nor is this the first time that she has acted in this manner. So this is actually very interesting because we find bias obviously in all historical documents. This one is actually criticizing England for not standing up for Native Americans in uh, essentially under European settler uh, kind of yoke um, and having you know land taken away from them, this kind of stuff. But what's interesting is this is the beginnings of a movement whereby you know Britain was only only too happy pre-independence to take as much land as it could, in some cases buy it uh, from France, for example. Uh, quite simply, they're now moving into a period where they're trying to big up the Native Americans and say, look at these noble uh, allies um, who we've done wrong by and we need to do right for them. So they're trying to build an almost Christian just cause for continuing war with 
what's now the free American states. Also, of course, this is a mention of a pipe tomahawk, of which this is actually a hammer-headed uh, type, so it doesn't have a pipe, but it's very much the same shape as this. Uh, so it is the showing of the importance, again, the tomahawk of being such a primary, together with the long knife, such a primary important uh, hand weapon of the Native Americans, but also it talks about throwing again. And if I didn't see so many historical accounts of these being thrown, I would have been a bit dubious uh, about them, to be honest, but it's mentioned time and time again the accuracy and effectiveness of these as throwing weapons. Uh, and there's a parallel there with early medieval Francisca, perhaps, in, in Western Europe. But, uh, so there we go. So these were very popular uh, and very famed weapons as throwing weapons as well as hand weapons. Now, no video looking at primary sources talking about tomahawks uh, and the long knife, incidentally, as well, would really be uh, true to the historical sources available without mentioning scalping. Uh, and certainly uh, the kind of politically incorrect and badly informed uh, sort of Western movies, I think, made a big thing of um, scalping in the early days of cinema. And indeed, this stems from 19th century literature talking about the frontier in the, in the Americas and the uh, and the carrying out of scal scalping. Now I realise that in modern times this has become a contentious topic, which I'm not going to go into because I don't know, know enough about it. But the fact is, I'm looking at sources from the 17th and um, uh, sorry from the 18th and 19th centuries here, and so here is one talking about scalping. I'm only using this one particularly because it talks about the effects of tomahawks specifically. So it says, uh, this is an article again in the Derby Mercury from November 1791. So again, it's post-American independence. Uh, it's on the verge of the Napoleonic Wars now. And it says, uh, it's titled Scalping Among the American Indians. Scalping is a mode of torture peculiar to the Indians. In a, if a blow is given with the tomahawk previous to the scalp being taken off, it's followed by instant death. But where the scalping only is inflicted, with a knife, presumably, it puts the person to excruciating pain, though death does not always ensue. There are instances of persons of both sexes now living in America and no doubt in other countries who, after having been scalped by wearing a plate of silver or tin on the crown of the head to keep it from the cold, <laughs> an infection, uh, enjoy a good state of health and are seldom afflicted with pains. <laughs> When an Indian strikes a person on the temple with a tomahawk, the victim instantly drops. He then seizes his hair with one hand, twisting it very tight together to prepare the skin for the so, sorry to separate the skin from the head, and placing his knee on the breast with the other, he draws the scalping knife from his, from the sheath and cuts the skin around the forehead, pulling it off with his teeth. As he is very dexterous, the operation is generally performed in two minutes. The scalp is then extended on three hoops, buried in the sun, sorry, dried in the sun, and rubbed over with vermilion. Some of the Indians in time of war, when scalps are well paid for, divide one into five or six parts and carry them to the nearest post in hopes of receiving a reward proportionate to their number. Now, we do obviously know, well, certainly the sources talk about uh, paying for scalps, and this happened in the um, British versus French War prior to independence um, and at other times as well. But I don't want to dwell on the scalping and the paying of uh, booty for it. Really here, I think the, the reason I picked out this article for reading is one, I thought it's an example where the tomahawk's mentioned in conjunction with scalping, and scalping is mentioned a lot in 18th and 19th century sources, but it talks about the tomahawk. So the tomahawk is the striking implement, and in this case, the knife is the scalping implement. So it does seem that there is a preference, and I know that obviously, in movies, we see the, the knife and the tomahawk used together, one in each hand, because movies love dual wielding. Looking at the original source material, I am somewhat dubious that dual wielding was done very much. It's not shown very much in the period art. It's not mentioned very much. Yes, indeed, the long knife and the tomahawk are both mentioned in the period sources, but they're usually mentioned being used separately. This is a rare case where they're being used together, but that's in a very particular scalping situation. And note that the first strike, the person, the, the way of felling the person is striking to the head with the tomahawk. The other thing I want to mention as well is certainly within a Native American context, it seems to be that the head, 
particularly the uh, forehead and the temple, are the primary targets for the tomahawk. Um, sometimes other targets are mentioned, such as arms, but usually the tomahawk seems to have been directed at the front or side of the upper part of the head with a downward blow. So that's why I pulled out this source, because it illustrates that quite nicely. And also it says the victim instantly drops. Well, most people with a good hit in the head with a tomahawk, I should imagine, do. This is now the British trying to uh, uh, destabilise, shall we say, the American nation in its infancy, um, or the new American nation in its infancy, by essentially trying to provoke and promote a Native American independence movement. Um, ironic, of course, that this should in some senses happen in Britain's empire later on in the 19th century, but that's something for another video. Um, and this talks about the defeat of General St. Clair. Now, if you uh, search General St. Clair, I won't do a video about him, about his fascinating, fascinating uh, military commander, military leader, but he had a major, major defeat when the uh, US Army, American Army, under his command, uh, was defeated by a confederation of Native Americans. And um, uh, again, I won't go into the whole campaign or exactly what happened, but I'll read this account. And this is reported in the Northampton Mercury, British newspaper, in January 1792. And it says, The warriors of the almost numberless combined Indian nations, having at length, length collected their forces, appeared in the van, in the back, of the American army, marshalled with much order in battle array. So that, according to the newspaper, there are just loads and loads and loads and massive thousands of, of confederated um, uh, Native Americans who come together, lots of different tribes, they've pulled together um, to basically try and defeat this um, American army under General St. Clair. A desperate conflict ensued and victory for a long time seemed suspended. At length, the Indians, throwing away their muskets, rushed with their bayonets and tomahawks, Bayonets and tomahawks, I suspect they need long knives and tomahawks, but anyway, because they've just thrown away their muskets, I suppose there's a possibility they could have been using bayonets dismounted from the muskets, but I think this is just the reporter, the journalist, using the wrong word for the implement. Um, but So let's say knives. Knives and tomahawks rushed upon the Americans, who dismayed no less by the horrified shrieks of the enemy than the suddenness and impetuosity of the attack fled on all sides. So the American army ran away. General St. Clair, with great courage and ability, rallied his forces and by the most judicious movements effected a tolerable retreat towards Kentucky, leaving, however, about 300 rank and file dead on the field of battle with the greatest part of his baggage and the whole of his plunder. It's not a little extraordinary that although 32 officers were wounded, not one was killed. So this incident actually happened in November 1791 and is uh, known today as St. Clair's Defeat, also known as the Battle of the Wabash, also the Columbia Massacre or the Battle of a Thousand Slain. And uh, it remains uh, to this day the greatest defeat of a US Army um, by Native Americans, by Native American Army in history, um, with about 623 American soldiers killed in action and about 50 Native Americans killed. So rather the difference to the newspaper article there and it's just a reminder to take what you read in the newspapers with a massive dose of salt but again we see the tomahawk featuring heavily here and it's interesting to see that certainly according to the article if it's correct the um, the Native American army realizing that uh, it maybe didn't have as much firepower as the um, American army but realizing that they had greater numbers and were probably therefore far more formidable in hand-to-hand -hand combat um, charged and this is echoed with things like the Highland charge uh, during the Jacobite rebellion and Battle of Culloden things like that also uh, um, the Zulus, for example, later in the 19th century, or the Sudanese, the dervishes, later in the 19th century. So very often an army which is equipped with, um, despite the fact they've got firearms, but is equipped with hand weapons and is greater in numbers, very often the successful tactic is to just rush the enemy so they can't stand there and reload and fire and reload and fire. So St. Clair's defeat, very interesting episode in which the tomahawk was blooded and featured uh, very heavily.
Now finally, we're actually going to move away from Native Americans uh, for the last couple of accounts, and that is because the word tomahawk passed into general usage to describe any sorts of hatchet or small axe. Uh, so this, the word tomahawk and the concept of a tomahawk uh, really entered the public imagination and even became applied to, as I say, other forms of hatchet or indeed naval boarding axe. And what we have here is a naval incident, although I should caveat that with, my assumption is this refers to a boarding axe, but it might possibly actually be what we'd commonly call a tomahawk. Let's read the account. So this is from the Hull Advertiser and Exchange Gazette from uh, January 1798. So we're now in the Napoleonic Wars era. Some further particulars relative to the mutiny on board the British frig frigate Hermione. When about three days out from Cape Nicola Mole on a cruise, part of the crew were engaged handing the mizzen topsail, the captain speaking sharply to them. Two of the men fell from the yards. When the others came down, they were reprimanded in harsh terms by the captain, and several of them were threatened with punishment. This occasioned much discontent. <laughs> In other words, the beginnings of a mutiny. It was the captain's fault. Which continued until the next evening, when the mutiny broke out. By throwing double-headed shot about the ship and other disorderly behaviour, <laughs> having a riot, basically, the first lieutenant went down to inquire what they wanted and was soon wounded in the arm with a tomahawk. So uh, my assumption is that means a boarding axe or any other type of hatchet. But it's interesting that they use the word tomahawk. And indeed, there is some possibility, I suppose, that it was literally what we'd call a tomahawk. He retired for some time. I imagine he did if he'd been hit in the arm with a tomahawk. And when he returned, he was knocked down with a tomahawk and his throat cut. And then he was thrown overboard. So he's, I mean, he's done for. After which the sailors proceeded to the cabin in search of the captain who'd locked himself in. <laughs> I imagine he had. I think I would have jumped overboard, um, <laughs> which is why I'm not captain of a ship. Um, but he too was soon dragged out after having wounded two or three and defending himself with his sword and experienced the fate of his unfortunate lieutenant. So he had his throat cut and he was thrown overboard as well. They afterwards seized upon and murdered every officer in the ship except a master's mate and two midshipmen. So they were sort of compassionate, I guess. The Spaniards have since manned the ship and sent her to sea. Our informant further adds that the crew of the Hermione were a mixture of several nations. I don't know why that's important, but maybe that's, the, I suppose, trying to ex excuse or explain the mutiny and the, the killing of the presumably British officers by the non-British crew. Well, frankly, in the Napoleonic Wars, the crews of most ships, including at the Battle of Trafalgar, were made up of people from many nations from all over the world. Um, and famously, you know, the British, the Royal Navy were um, freeing slaves and then basically, not forcing, but basically forcing them into service on board Royal Navy ships. But anyway, that's a topic for another video. Here we have Tomahawk used twice as a weapon on board a ship, on a Royal Navy ship. Um, and I just think that that's interesting that whether it is a literal Tomahawk or what I suspect it's more likely to be a hatchet or a boarding axe, they call it a Tomahawk. So that word Tomahawk has really permeated certainly the British public's mindset. Here we have another incident at sea on board a ship um, and it is titled Mate Tomahawked by a Seaman. Uh, and again, we've got things being described here as tomahawks, uh, which may or may not be tomahawks, but they're some type of hatchet or axe. Could be a boarding axe. I think probably more likely a boarding axe. But nevertheless, it shows that the word tomahawk has become prevalent. It does describe violence, um, so let's read it anyway because it's interesting to see how people use axes uh, in the, in this case, in 1888. So, mate tomahawked by a seaman. The Melbourne Argus just received says, the British American ship Luciana, belonging to Nova Scotia, which arrived in Hobson's Bay on Tuesday last, reported the occurrence of a shocking tragedy which took place on the 12th of July during the voyage from New York. On the date named, the vessel was travelling along at a good pace, and the wind being rather fresh, two men were stationed at the wheel. One of these, a young Swede, 
those Swedish, named Theodore Hansen, was on the weather side of the wheel. The steering of the ship was bad several times, and the second mate, Hugh McKinnon, remonstrated with Hansen. An altercation ensued, during which McKinnon gave Hansen a kick. Never kick a Swede. Nothing further then passed. Sometime after, Hansen was relieved in the usual course for the purpose of going forward and taking his coffee. While there, he appears to have entered the carpenter's shop and secreted a tomahawk on his person. So, my interpretation here is probably not a tomahawk if it's in the carpenter's shop. It's a wood chopping axe, it's a hatchet. So here we have something that's, I think, a hatchet or a boarding axe. It's unlikely to be what we'd typically call a tomahawk, but it's described as a tomahawk in the source. So having secreted the tomahawk on his person, he then returned aft onto the poop deck where McKinnon was sitting, smoking his pipe near the wheel. Hansen advanced towards him quietly and drawing the tomahawk without a word, suddenly raised it and dealt McKinnon a fearful blow on the head with the edge of the weapon, which buried itself deeply into the man's skull. And there it remained for Hansen, immediately leaving go of the handle, ran away along the poop deck on his hands and feet down onto the main deck. The second mate, with the tomahawk still sticking in his head, also descended to the main deck and called out for the captain with an axe sticking out of his head. The tomahawk then fell to the deck and he was removed to his berth. All that was possible for the wounded man under the circumstances was done, uh, was done by those on board, but the wound was of such a terrible nature that he lingered for five days and then died on July the 17th, or eight days before reaching port. Hansen was placed in irons, I bet he was, and handed over to the police immediately on arrival uh, of the vessel in port. He's not quite 20 years old and looks even younger. So, my, Hansen had a hell of a temper on him, didn't he? Um, angry Swede with a wood carpenter's axe, I would say. But the important part for the purposes of this video is they refer to it as a tomahawk. So the word tomahawk had really entered into the public consciousness. Now, coming back to the sources, there are some interesting things that we can take away. The fact is that the word tomahawk is sl slightly problematic when we're looking at period sources because it can describe any type of smallish axe, okay? But definitely in regards to when it's referred to with Native Americans, there was a very strong, particularly in the 18th century and into the 19th century, um, idea that it was Native Americans, this was a Native American weapon, and their use of the axe was world famous, certainly in English-speaking countries. Um, and so absolutely, they were famed for the use of this weapon. It was a close combat weapon, and it seems it was probably a thrown weapon, and there's quite a lot of period sources referring to the throwing of this. When it wasn't thrown and when it was used in hand, it seems to have been mainly used to strike at the head um, by people who knew how to use it, usually at the forehead or the sides of the head, the temples. Um, and so this seems to have been the primary way it was used, and it was often used in conjunction with a long knife, although it's my belief from the sources and the artwork, the written sources and the artwork of the period, that they weren't probably usually used together as we sometimes see in movies. They were probably used for different purposes, uh, one after the other. Um, so a very important weapon, and I'm sure there are more really good primary sources to dig out uh, by their use, not just, of course, by Native Americans, but also used by European Americans in the American War of, War of Independence, but also just generally as handy belt weapons as frontier weapons uh, that could be used as a tool but were often used as weapons and I have to say they can be used at all but they are quite different to tool axes and actually even if we look at naval boarding axes naval boarding axes are usually larger and heavier than what are typically regarded as tomahawks uh, or trade axes are. Um, thanks a lot for watching give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already and I hope I'll see you back on the channel again really soon. Cheers folks! Thanks for watching we've got extra videos on Patreon please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks!